Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our webinar entitled Shifting Gears, Farm Management Strategies for a Tougher Operating Environment. I'm Jim Minter, Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And joining me today are my colleagues, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's a professor of ag economics and also the Associate Director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, and Nathan Thompson, who is an Associate Professor of Ag Economics here at Purdue and one we work with very closely on the Center. So we've shifted gears just a little bit with respect to the topic for today. And instead of focusing so much on the shorter run outlook, we thought at the end of the year it would be a good idea to focus a little more on some longer term factors that might influence how you choose to manage your farming operation in 2023, particularly in light of the fact that we think the operating environment is really starting to change and maybe requires some different strategies going forward. So Michael, you took a look at real U.S. net farm income, and you know, as I look at that chart, especially these last two years, it looks pretty darn good. It really does, and, and we've been talking about this for uh, several webinars in a row, that 21 and 22 are very good, and this just puts it in perspective. Those are two of the better years we've seen since 1973. Uh, but what we're gonna try to, uh, try to argue here today is 23 is not gonna be near as good as 21 and 22, and so that's what, that's what we mean by it's a different environment. Yeah, the strategies that worked the last couple of years are not likely to be uh, nearly as effective as they were the last two years. And, and so before we get to net returns, let's talk a little bit about interest rates. And what I've got here is the, uh, F the F Fed funds rate. Uh, this is the overnight rate between, uh, uh, between banks that are part of the Federal Reserve uh, System. And, and what we're showing here is 22 looks relatively small, but it's been increasing all year. It started out the year in 22 at almost zero. I think it was 0 0.08 uh, starting out in 22. Uh, in, in December, uh, 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 recently it increased to 4.33%. And so it's increased over 4% uh, in 22. And, and uh, it's not over yet. Uh, as I indicated, we're at 4.33% uh, right now. It's expected to climb to 5.1% uh, in 23. And so we've, we've got approximately another 1% increase in Fed funds rate, uh, which is going to translate into a higher prime rate and a higher operating uh, interest rate for, for farm loans as well as other loans. Uh, and it's going to be fairly it's going to persist for a while. And so if you're expecting to get back to the environment we had uh, from 16 to 21, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, you know, looking at 2024 in this chart, uh, the Fed fund rate at 4.1%, still relatively high, 3.1% uh, in 25. I don't have it on this chart. Past 25, they're expecting the fund, Fed fund rate to be 2.5. And, so and so the point here, it's going to increase, it's going to be relatively high in 23, and, and it's going to persist for a while. It's going to stay uh, relatively high compared to where we've been the last several years uh, for the extended future. So Michael, I want to point out, I think, for our viewers that the projections you have on the right in red, that 5.1 for 23, the 4.1 for 24, and the 3.1 for 25, those are the averages coming off the Federal Reserve uh, yes. forecast by the Board of Governors, essentially, yes. right? The Open Market Committee. And They've been adjusting those every single meeting. Yes. So those aren't exactly set in concrete. No, the, the, the 23 <laughs> number, for example, the 23 projection uh, was increased a half a percentage point uh, this last meeting. And so uh, it, it could go higher. It depends, on, it depends on how effective they are in controlling inflation. If they have difficulty in controlling inflation, that 5.1 will, will be higher than 5.1. Yeah, and I think the critical factor there is what happens in 24 and 25, because as you think about it, there's a lot of people in the marketplace that are pretty skeptical about the ability to pull inflation down that rapidly that would allow the Fed to revert to a, a looser or an easier monetary policy that quickly, right? Yes, and so that 3.1 could be north of 3.1, so good, good point. Yeah, I think the other way to look at it is to say that 5.1 might just persist for a couple of years. And when you think about it from a management strategy, I think that's one of the things you want to think about in terms yeah. of your capital assets uh, and your, your operating environment in terms of how much money you're borrowing and what it might cost, right? Definitely. Now to put a little bit of perspective on, on the relationship between the Fed funds rate, that's an overnight rate again, and the prime rate and the Federal Reserve Bank Chicago operating interest rate. Uh, I've got this chart right here. and We've got this from 16 to 22. Let's focus on the 22 numbers right here. Uh, you can see if you look at the Fed funds rate uh, compared to the prime rate, you're usually looking at about a 4% a difference. Uh, it, um, the, uh, the prime rate right now is, is actually 7.5 and, and the uh, Fed funds rate is 4.33, so it's about 3% difference right now, but, but that sometimes is, is anywhere from 3 to 4%. 
Uh, when you look at the relationship between the prime interest rate and the operating interest rate, uh, you're looking at something uh, that's usually 1.5%. I think historically uh, the average difference between those two is 1.6%. Is and so when you start looking at that 5.1 uh, Fed funds rate, that really translates into an operating interest rate that's 9.5%, 10%. Uh, and so that's a little bit sobering. We haven't seen 10% uh, operating interest rate for quite some time, but that's what that 5.1 uh, projected Fed funds rate really means uh, as we're looking at, at, at an operating interest rate that's, that's 95 to 10%. Yeah, I think that's kind of a shocker for a lot of people, and particularly as we start uh, re-upping operating notes for the upcoming year. The rates being uh, proposed are substantially different than what were proposed this time last year. And again, thinking about what might happen in 24 and 25, it's not set in stone that we're going to see those rates start to come down that rapidly. So I think from a management perspective, it's important to think about what might happen if those that federal funds rate actually persist and that five to five and a half percent range um, and what that implies for, for and, your farming and, operation. And obviously this has impacts on, on, on asset purchases, uh, buying land, buying machinery, uh, you know, build, building grain bins and borrowing part of the money to, to do that, but also storage. We're going to talk about storage options here, and uh, I know you did some exercises in your class, Jim, where you looked at the impact of higher interest rates on storage. It really does make a difference. Yeah, particularly on a, on a high-priced uh, crop like soybeans. If you change your assumption about the interest rate from, say, 4.5%, which is something that would have been pretty realistic here until just recently, and all of a sudden start looking at an interest rate, an operating loan rate of about 9 or 9.5%, it makes a big difference on the cost of storage, and you've looked at that as well, Nathan. Yeah. Just one more slide on this. This is through the third quarter of 2022, and so uh, at this time we had a prime rate of five and a half. It's now two percent higher than that, uh, and so and so and so again, uh, it's just this is the actual data. Uh, but as you can see here, we have not seen interest rates this high uh, since 2007. So it's been quite a while uh, since we've seen interest rates this high. Yeah. So if you had to guess today, Michael, thinking about what that average is going to be for the fourth quarter in 2022 instead of 6.5, what do you think? Uh, 6.5, I think it's going to be closer to, to 8. Yeah, already, Seven, start, half, eight. already starting to have a big and impact. And then another uh, 1 to 2 percent, depending on what the Fed does, uh, in 23. Okay. So we've made the case that, obviously, and I, as a lot of our viewers already knew, interest rates have been rising, and so that, that has been very much in the news. Let's take a look at some of the other input cost, and this is based on some data that USDA publishes uh, bi-weekly uh, for the state of Illinois. It's called the Illinois Production Cost Report, where they report on prices for various fertilizers as well as diesel fuel. And I, what I did is I took the data going back to 2014 and kind of assumed that that 2014 to 2016 time frame was kind of a normal period, and I indexed everything relative to that 2014 to 2016 uh, period. So. Stated another way, if you average the index values on that chart from 2014 to 2016, they're going to average out to 100. Values above 100 are when inputs are more expensive than they were during that environment, and inputs cheaper than that would have been below 100. So you look at the right-hand side of the chart, and you see the dramatic increase we've seen across the board with respect to fertilizers, uh, anhydrous doubling, uh, potash virtually doubling, um, MAP done, not quite doubling, I think 1.75. 1, 1, so uh, and diesel uh, actually starting to come down a little bit uh, in that report. So this, this report is pretty recent. There are data on there just through last week. So it is picking up some of that weakness we've seen in diesel and, and fuel prices here these last few weeks. But still very, very high cost. So higher interest rates, higher input cost. Um, what's happened to prices? This is based on the monthly average prices. So these are cash prices reported on, on surveys from farmers uh, and elevators uh, over the last, uh, going back again to 2014 to 2016 as, a, as an average period. Notice that they are stronger, but when you compare the index values for soybeans and corn to what I just showed you with respect to cost and what Michael was showing you with respect to interest rates, you can see that the improvement in crop prices has not kept pace. Uh, with what's taking place on the cost side. And perhaps more importantly is the softness that's showing up on the right-hand side of that chart. Now there's a little difference in the time frame here. The prices received in seas are only available through October, so we don't have data yet for November or obviously December. Uh, but I don't think those index values for the fourth quarter here are going to change very much. And so I think the story remains the same. And the story is tighter margins, right? That's really the story here. Higher cost, um, so somewhat softer prices, uh, with some downside risk, 
uh, leading to significantly tighter margins going forward. And the other cost, Michael, we haven't talked about yet is cash rent. Yeah, before I get to the cash rent, let me talk a little bit about uh, 23 prices. Uh, I think we're going to show that the 23 prices for corn and soybeans are lower than what they currently are. Input costs are not going to be lower necessarily. And so just a continuation of that margin squeeze. Uh, obviously, interest rate is one of those costs that's increased uh, relatively rapidly. We were talking before the, before the show here today, and, and, and you were comparing uh, 2017 to 22. It's a lot of difference. Uh, that's over $50 uh, increase in cash rent since 2017, uh, and we are very close uh, to the 2014 peak. Uh, and so it didn't take us all that long uh, to get back to that, that at 2014 peak, peak with the relatively high corn and soybean prices we've seen in 21 and 22. So for clarity here, Michael, these are nominal values, not adjusted for inflation. These are nominal correct. values for West Central Indiana average land productivity. Okay. I mean, some people are looking at this chart and say, well, I pay well over $300. Well, if you have high land productivity, your rent is well over $300 right now. All right, so let's take a look at the break-evens. And you've taken a look at this not only for uh, the projections for 23, but given us some pretty interesting historical context as well. Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting when you start looking when you start looking at cost changes year to year, uh, it it doesn't they don't uh, input costs uh, look like they continue to climb. Uh, for example, if you look at from October to October, uh, all inputs used in production agriculture the increase is 15 percent. Uh, we're showing corn and soybeans today, but you know if you look at all commodities, the increase is 15 percent. That compares very unfavorably to the to inflation rate of six seven percent, and so uh, input costs have increased at a much faster rate than inflation, and that looks like it's going to continue into twenty three. Uh, we're showing break even prices for twenty three for average land productivity above six dollars per bushel. It's just it just amazes me every time I look at that figure uh, that the break evens are, are that high, but that, that's what inflation does. You know that's what high input costs uh, two years in a row you know, increases in input costs two years in a row. Uh, will do to break evens, and uh, uh, we've all, we've got on the title here as a subtitle: the 23 break even price is 37 percent higher in 21. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I have never seen two years in a row uh, that's seen that large of increase. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think before we go further, Michael, I think we should probably back up a little bit and explain just how you put these numbers together. So one of the key points, uh, kind of an assumption in, in the budgets. All the owned resources are priced at market value. So, for example, owned farmland is priced into your budget at the current cash rental rate, correct? And it's, it's actually a five percent higher than the current cash rent. I'm, I'm assuming, For twenty-three, yeah, right. I'm assuming a five percent increase. It also has the higher interest rate projection uh, in there. I've also got some higher prices for things like repairs and uh, and, and things like that that have been increasing uh, re that, that have been increasing relatively rapidly the last couple of years. And so, yes, uh, the variable inputs are in there, but also these own resources. I th from a viewer standpoint, I think from people maybe comparison making comparisons to their own accounting records versus is what you're projecting here. That's going to be the big difference, the fact that those owned resources and from an accounting record perspective are not going to show up in there. Yeah, definitely. And those are those are large. I mean, if you own ground and you use, you're talking about $300 cash rent, that's a lot that's a lot of difference. But it's also operator labor. I mean, we got operator labor in here at $40 uh, per acre, so that's that's not in your cash records. And then also own machinery. Uh, quite a few people own a, a majority of their machinery. Well, here we've priced all of that in. We've got a charge uh, for the own machinery. Uh, just a little tidbit here that I, I find very interesting. It's a little depressing, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. We well, look at the break even to cover variable costs, it's $4. Uh, that compares to the 21 break even of high productivity for all costs was $4. That just tells us how much these variable inputs have went up in two years. It's not just fertilizer. Fertilizer is a big part of that, but it's not just fertilizer. Yeah, that's a good point. So on soybeans, a similar story. Similar story. The, 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 uh, uh, the increase since 21 is not as big, uh, primarily because of nitrogen fertilizer. You, we don't have any nitrogen fertilizer in, in the soybean budget, so that's the main difference there. Uh, also, cash rent uh, is, uh, accounts for a bigger percentage, and cash, believe it or not, cash rent uh, cash rent increases are not as big as some of the other inputs. Usually, cash rent is the one that increases the fastest, uh, and, you know, and, and so that's not the case right now. Fertilizer uh, is increasing faster, so about a 25% increase since 21, uh, and another 8 to 9% uh, when you look at 23 compared to 22. Now, cut, uh, keep these uh, break-evens in mind because we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the iFarm price distribution tool. 
uh, which has a distribution of prices, and, and we want to keep in mind uh, the 610 break even for corn uh, and the 1355 for soybeans and see how that compares. Yeah, you know, Nathan, as I look at those numbers, I get the first thing that jumps up at me when I think uh, the corn break evens, for example, starting with a six, yeah. right? Uh, and soybeans, you know, you've got, depending on which productivity category you're looking at, uh, a 13, uh, maybe a 14. Uh, that low productivity category on soybeans is pretty unbelievable, Michael. Yes, it really is. I mean, it's just, it's, it just it, who would have thought this? You know, uh, we've done, been doing these webinars for quite a while. We were doing these webinars in 21. I don't think any of us would have thought that the, the cost would be this high. So dramatic change there. So we've made a case for a different operating environment with respect to cost of doing business, interest rates higher, inputs higher, significantly higher break-evens, uh, cash rent still continuing to rise, at least we think in, into 2020, excuse me, 2023. Let's take a look a little bit more at the commodity price outlook side. Um, so the positive news is ending stocks are still pretty tight if you look at corn. Uh, USDA's most recent ending stocks projection just under 9% at 8.9% for the 2022 crop year. Third year in a row that that ending stock estimate can be in the ballpark of 9%. That puts us back in the vicinity of where we were in that 2011, 2012, 2013 time frame. Um, but as you look forward into 2023, that's when some question marks start to show up. So one of the things that took place in uh, 2022 was corn yields were below trend. Uh, this year's estimate, which might get revised slightly in January by USDA, but probably not very, very much, uh, came in at 172.3. That's down roughly four bushels per acre compared to 21 um, and well below the trend. The trend yield for next year, Nathan, is 183. Uh, and now, I, I should probably caution that a little bit because viewers all winter long are going to hear different trend yield numbers from various people. Um, that particular trend estimate is based on data going back to the mid-90s up through uh, just recently. Uh, other people are going to come up with some numbers that differ from that a little bit, but they're not going to differ a lot. It's going to be in that 182 to 183 range for most people, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it'll be in that ballpark. And, you know, given what you just mentioned with, with relatively tight carryovers, these numbers are going to be paid very close attention to as we go into the 23 crop. Yeah, so that means weather's going to be a big issue again in, yeah. in, in 23. Uh, people are going to be watching very closely with respect to planting conditions and then obviously the, the early stages of the growing season. But if we see a return to trend, that does suggest those uh, ending stocks numbers starting to loosen up. And then you start thinking about what's going on on a worldwide basis. So this is world corn and soybean acreage, uh, harvested acres, not planted acres going back to 2005, and it's a little bit astounding to me to think about how much the worldwide acreage to corn and soybeans has increased over the last roughly 17 years now. Less than 600 million acres uh, in 2005, now we're up in the 833 million acre range. And then I think the other thing is to think about those year-by-year -year increases and think about what might happen to corn and soybean acreage. Uh, even though we're talking about some tighter margins going forward, um, our odds are pretty good. We're going to see some increase in acreage in 23 show up. And the annual average increase over the last decade has been about 11 million acres. That doesn't mean it's necessarily going to increase by 11 million acres next year, but it does just give you an indication of the likelihood that we're going to see uh, acreage pick up somewhat. Again, that argues for loosening that supply-demand balance that's been relatively tight now for these last couple of years. Um, the war in Ukraine did tighten world supplies in 22, but I have to say not as much as we thought when the invasion first occurred in late February and, and early March, uh, when it looked like Ukraine had very uh, tremendous difficulty exporting anything. It turns out there has been more exported from Ukraine, both legally and perhaps illegally, based on some of the news reports. Uh, so there, a larger share of that has gotten to the marketplace. but. As you look at it from a standpoint going forward, it does suggest fewer supplies coming out of that Black Sea region than we would have seen otherwise. So that probably is going to be another tightening factor in 23. But again, it's a true wild card with respect to what might happen there, right? I mean, that's, that's going to be our challenge in terms of guessing what's going to happen. Um, if you think about the major competitors for corn exports relative to the U.S., those consist of, and I've listed them on the slide there, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, which is ZAF, uh, Ukraine, and Russia. And as you look at it, you can see how the U.S. has been increasing exports, but 
from a trend line basis going back over the last 10 years. But notice the more rapid increase in exports from those competing exporters. And that gets back to the idea that we've got some stiff competition in, in the export channels that we didn't used to have, uh, at least not to the extent uh, that we do today. So again, uh, we're not quite the residual supplier that we used to be. Um, turning our attention on the soybean side, soybean stocks are actually tighter than they are on the corn side. Uh, USDA's latest estimate still hanging at that roughly 5% level from the 22 crop into the 23 crop year. Keep in mind, at one point, we thought that might be down around 4%, so it's somewhat larger than we thought earlier in the growing season, but still a relatively tight carryover. Um, but if, again, you think about what's going on in South America. Uh, this is the U.S. versus Brazil and Sargent, Argentina's soybean acreage. And you can see for roughly the last 20 years, those two countries on a combined basis have had a harvested acreage larger than the U.S., and that gap continues to widen. Um, how much their acreage might increase in the upcoming year is questionable, uh, but it's definitely not going to stay flat. I think I'd be very surprised if we don't see another round of increases in acreage going forward into the 23 planting season for, for South America. Um, and virtually all that probably going to be in Brazil. Very little of that is probably going to be in Argentina. Um, Even that being the case, there's still going to be a there's still going to be a lot of competition for acres in the United States, corn versus soybeans, uh, and particularly in the soybean side. With that stocks to use being at five percent, uh, that's that's a signal to me that that uh, the U.S. needs more soybeans. And I think uh, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit more later on, Michael, but I think your budgets currently are favoring yes. soybeans over corn, and that's a, really a, an attempt in the marketplace to bid yes. uh, more acres going into soybeans relative to corn. Um, if you look on the export side, no big surprise given the acreage increases in South America, uh, they've been gaining ground relative to the U.S. on the export side. So very strong competition coming out of South America, and I don't see that going away uh, into the 23 season. So if you look at it, so far we've made the case that costs are up, break-evens are up, um, and there's at least a good chance that we're going to see ending stocks, uh, the tightness in ending stocks alleviated in 23, particularly if we see a return to average weather conditions. That argues for some softer prices, um, and I guess, Michael, that kind of sets the stage for your net farm projections for 23. Yeah, these projections are median prices. We're going to talk about how how big a band there is, particularly for corn, uh, but both for corn and soybeans. And so it's certainly possible uh, that we could see a, you know, see a, a, a net farm income per acre as good as 22. It's not likely. I, I would say that's 25% or less, uh, looking at the numbers myself. Uh, the most likely scenario is something that's lower than the long-run average. The long-run average from 2007 uh, to 2021 for this case farm is about $140. Uh, we're looking at something lower than that, and we're looking at something that's a little bit lower even than 2019, uh, at, at least at this time. And, 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 and as you said, Jim, this is a combination of, of lower crop prices, uh, looking at uh, November and December uh, 2023, uh, but also uh, that increase in the, in the costs. Uh, and so you just have that classic margin squeeze, uh, you know, coming off two really good years, an increase in price, uh, and the prices are coming down a little bit, uh, and costs uh, actually going up uh, rather than down. And so, uh, and so that's, what, that's, that's why we're resulting in a relatively low net farm income uh, for 23. So, Michael, let's back up a little bit and talk about some of the assumptions you had to use to, to put together a chart like this. So the first thing, obviously this is based on a West Central Indiana case farm, so you're using yields, uh, crop insurance returns, et cetera, for West Central Indiana. The other thing, though, you're doing is, and I think some of our viewers might be interested in knowing, is how you've structured the marketing program for this particular farm. Because you had to make an assumption yes. and they kept that uh, assumption constant across time. Well, first of all, for yields, I use trend yields. Uh, you know, if, if you have higher than trend yields, obviously it'll look better than this. But if you have worse, it'll look worse than this. Uh, and so I'm using trend yield there. The marketing strategy is a very simple strategy. You might argue maybe too simple, but it, it's just uh, marketing half the crop uh, in October, November, December, and then the rest of crop uh, in January, February, and March, all cash. 
Um, and, and so it's a very simple strategy where you're marketing some in the, in the, uh, uh, the year of harvest and then marketing the rest, 50%, uh, after the first of the year. And then you keep that strategy constant across yes. years, and that kind of gives you some comparability yeah, across yeah. years. And we've got a graduate student right now that's looking at uh, using some simple cash strategies along with, along with, with some hedging strategies, and, and, and that works. It's, it's not finished yet, uh, but it seems like, a, it seems like mixing uh, some hedging strategies along with a cash strategy is better than just using the cash strategy. And so maybe at a future webinar, we'll talk some more about that. That's, that's encouraging for those of us that teach commodity yes. futures. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and risk management, yeah, right? So, yeah. all right. Uh, so Nathan, you've taken a look at basis, and we're going to look at basis a couple of different ways. For, we're going to start off by looking at basis in terms of what's been taking place here this fall. And then we're going to talk about it from a little longer term standpoint and think about what that means for risk management. Start really talking about strategies people can employ in 23 to maybe kind of manage their way through this tighter operating environment. Right, exactly. I mean, so, so what I really want to get across as we look at the next couple charts is the idea is we've been alluding to is we're entering this kind of uh, era of, of likely tighter margins. And so, you know, we talk about basis a lot and, and basis impacts your cash price no matter what your marketing strategy is. But, but the, the, the argument that I want to make is in a time where we have tighter margins, right, we need to be really thinking about managing futures and basis separately, right? We need to be paying attention to both of those components uh, in order to get the most out of our marketing program, again, to, to get the best margin that we can in an environment where we know margins are going to be tighter. And so what we're looking at here on this first uh, map is kind of a heat map of current basis levels uh, this month. Uh, across uh, the kind of corn producing regions of the United States. And so what you see is the difference in color. Uh, the, the purple and blues would, would indicate stronger basis, so more positive basis. And you can see as you move out west, we see more of the, these purple and blue basis values, stronger basis out that way. So again, if you've been paying attention, they dealt with some drought uh, out west this year, uh, resulting in lower yields. And so when we have lower yields, right, there's a higher demand for corn out that way. So they increase basis uh, in order to kind of pull in corn to that region. As you move east, right, the, the oranges and the reds are more uh, negative or weaker basis where we've had kind of better production this year. And so really what we're looking at as we look at it kind of, you know, one uh, cross section of time, looking at it this year, what happened with production, we see stronger basis out, out west, really indicating, right, markets are telling us we're, we're needing to pull corn from east to west this year in order to meet the demands out there, right? So there's a lot of animal feeding that happens out in those regions where they had some production shortfalls. And again, at this point in time, right, those stronger basis levels haven't really trickled back as far east as, as where we are in Indiana. But uh, as producers are looking at their marketing plans uh, for crop that, uh, 22 crop that you have in storage, uh, many people have crop uh, that they're probably trying to wait till after the first of the year to market uh, to defer that income. So if you're, if you're holding that corn, you know, looking into, you know, the beginning of 23, uh, what I'm saying is, you know, what we've seen so far is a lot of appreciation in basis uh, to this point in the year with, based on historical patterns, not a lot more uh, appreciation, at least based on those historical patterns. But potential for unique kind of basis opportunities this spring and this summer, I think, are there because of this production shortfall that we saw out west, indicating, right, there may be some basis opportunities as the need for that corn trickles back. Uh, we need to pull that corn east to west. And so that's kind of what I'm indicating for, for folks that have 22 crop in storage and you're thinking about, you know, what your plan is for that crop moving into the beginning of next calendar year is paying attention to basis because there very likely could be some unique basis opportunities given what we know is going on out west. And, you know, based on previous experience with this kind of movement, you know, we've seen the opposite where we had to pull corn from the west to the east right. when we had some shortfalls in the east. And historically, I think we tend to see the biggest basis plays, so to speak, in the areas that are short corn. Right. So I would probably expect more unusual basis opportunities to pop up in the western half of the Corn Belt versus the eastern half. Do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%, right? And so the question is, like, how far does that trickle back until they're able to pull the corn that they need, right? So you really have to pay attention. And there's going to be some situations that are going to pop up and maybe last for a few days or a few weeks at most. 
And so what we're really arguing is you need to pay attention, right? Yeah, absolutely, right. So I'm not, th this isn't gonna, you know, I'm not expecting a huge shift in the pattern, so to speak, of average basis, you know, across a wide area. I'm thinking, you know, unique, one-off, couple days here or there where we have something that needs to move. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I think people need to be looking Just for. Just to give the viewer some idea of how big a difference there is in corn prices between Indiana and Kansas, I looked at some inventory uh, prices for feedlots in, 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 the, in, in southwest <coughs> Kansas this morning, and the, the latest date is in October. So I'm looking at October uh, cash price, inventory prices in Kansas uh, compared to U.S. average price. It was $2 higher. Uh, the inventory price was $2 higher. Uh, and so, and what all that all that means is the pan the panhandle of Texas and, and southwest Kansas is is usually short corn. They're always short corn. But now with a bad with a bad crop there, a bad crop further north, where they're pulling corn from, it's a serious it's serious shortage of corn. Yeah, so it's really going to require some movement. So there's going to be some opportunities. We saw some of that this fall, even here in the eastern corn belt in Indiana, for example. We saw some unusual basis swings, and some of them didn't last very long. Right. All right, so you've taken a look at corn basis at the Southern Indiana River terminals and at the Indiana ethanol plants, and you've really looked at it going back to 2018 in one chart, which is kind of an interesting way to do it. Yeah, so I really wanted to give viewers a little bit different perspective of kind of how these basis values move and not looking at it maybe just for one individual year, but looking at, you know, four or so years. And again, I picked two kind of representative locations, you know, one being river terminals, the other being ethanol plants. I think the same would hold true. Like, I really just want to make the point that not all locations offer the same basis all the time, right? That's, that's one of the things that I want to point out here. The other thing is, you know, we hear a lot of times when we do commodity marketing uh, workshops that, oh, well, basis at, at my location is, is the same all year round, right? And that's the other thing, you know, look at this chart. It's not the same all the time, right? And so... Really, the, the idea is, you know, you need to be paying attention to basis because number one, it does vary across time and it tends to follow a seasonal pattern. So if you've tapped into the Purdue Center for Commercial Ag's crop basis tool, that's the whole point of the tool. You have historical data to kind of better understand the patterns in your local region of what basis typically does. The other thing, like I mentioned, is, you know, not every location uh, has the same pattern and those things vary, you know, across time and across space. And so, you know, if you look at the chart here, we've got the, the river terminals and the ethanol plants. And there's a couple of things that I just want to point out to kind of make, make the case that, you know, you really have to pay attention to what's going on in terms of, you know, a current demand situation uh, for corn. So if you look, for example, uh, in, you know, spring, summer of 2019, we have ethanol plant basis really going up pretty strongly, reaching a high of about 50 cents there. Uh, at the same time, right, uh, corn basis at those river terminals was weakening, right, and just didn't have the export demand in 2019 uh, that we've had maybe in some other years. And so, you know, the difference between that 50 and 20, I mean, you're talking about 70 cents difference in basis uh, between those two markets, right? And so not everybody has access to a river terminal or an ethanol plant basis, but everybody has access to different markets, right? And so if you're not paying attention to various markets and what's going on in those markets, they're not necessarily moving in the same direction and you need to be kind of looking around when you're talking about separating that futures and basis uh, pieces of those marketing plans and really getting the most out of that basis because, you know, we talk about it a lot. Sometimes, you know, you may have to haul to a further location and yes, there's transportation costs associated with that, but when you see some of these bigger swings, right, a lot of times there might be an opportunity to, to more than make up for those transportation costs uh, when you talk about the difference in basis based on some, you know, local demand situation, right? And as you look at the right-hand side, and again, keep in mind these are, these are averaged across the southern Indiana River terminals and then the Indiana ethanol plants. What do you think is going to happen here as we move into the summer? Do you think we're going to see, we've seen some pretty big uh, spikes in basis, do you think we'll see any chance for those kind of spikes this coming summer? I mean, so, you know, what, what we saw was with the Mississippi River levels this, uh, this fall, basis just collapsed down there on the river markets. That has recovered surprisingly well, in my opinion, based on what's happened with the river level. I mean, the river levels have improved, but they're, they're not back to normal by any means. Uh, and so the question will be, you know, what is export demand for corn. Uh, you know, we've seen soft uh, export demand for corn so far uh, this crop marketing year. So that's going to be a big factor. But then also what happens with river levels, right? Do we get some moisture where it's easier and also cheaper 
uh, to move corn down the river because that's that's kind of in the play is you know not only has it been hard to navigate the river but because of that it's become much more expensive right barge rates have uh, increased considerably uh, as a result of that and so not only is it harder to get it down the river it's much more expensive to get it down the river and so both of those things are going to be at play when we think about you know what corn basis in particular corn basis uh, along those river markets is going to do this summer but there certainly are opportunities for that to increase but again you know we've all we've made up all of the collapse that we saw there in, in the beginning of October and so we're really back to normal basis levels um, in, in southern Indiana and so the question will be you know what can we see in terms of demand from those export markets that's going to drive what happens with basis going forward. Yeah good point. Soybeans uh, you've, you've done similar analysis for soybeans. Yeah so starting off again with this map of just kind of current basis levels across the, the kind of um, commodity producing regions of the United States. A similar story here where you can see kind of the, the lighter blue basis values there in kind of southeast Kansas where they really were hit hard by drought impacting soybean yields uh, in, in that part of the country. Again, an incentive to maybe move some corn east to west there. Not necessarily as strong as what we saw on the corn side, uh, but still some evidence of that sort of need to move east to west. The other thing that I would point out on the soybean chart that's maybe a little bit different is you can see kind of along the Mississippi River there in the Mississippi Delta area, we see some blues and grays and purples, again, indicating those stronger basis levels. And I think that, again, comes back to this idea of, number one, river levels being low, the need to pull in some soybeans, right, in those regions to fulfill um, export orders. But again, the stronger soybean export demand relative to corn export demand that we've seen uh, in recent months uh, is indicating that, again, on the soybean side, right, that river market is very important uh, in terms of pulling in soybeans and, and basis being the tool that they're using to do that. Yeah, if you look at the weekly export data for soybeans relative to corn, it's been much stronger, uh, and that's being reflected in these charts. So you're looking at the, the longer-term uh, analysis on the soybean basis as well? So, again, the the... the <coughs> The objective here is the same. So number one, right, uh, the fact that basis is not constant all the time, right? So it does vary and, and you know, varies a lot in, in some instances. Um, and also the fact that, you know, basis doesn't always move in the same direction at these different um, uh, end users, right? So again, I've got uh, river terminal basis uh, as the gold line. And then <clears throat> instead of uh, ethanol, I've got soybean processors, where again, I'm just averaging the soybean processors. Uh, across the state of Indiana, giving us kind of this average basis level at those, those processors. And again, what you see is that those two values maybe move in the same direction a lot of the time, but there are many instances where they diverge from one another. So again, a good example on this chart would be uh, summer of 21. We saw really, really strong processor returns, uh, soybean processor returns, and that had really big uh, impacts on soybean basis, both in Illinois and in Indiana, uh, causing those basis values to really increase. And you can see right at that same time, we had, you know, um, soybean basis at those river terminals that was weakening, right? So again, a difference between a positive 87 cents and a positive 16 cents, you know, you're easily looking at 70 cent difference there um, in, in those basis values. That's, those are big differences at the exact same time in, in, you know, different locations, right? And so you, again, you really got to pay attention uh, to what's going on in the markets that are around you. And again, it may not be a processor, you may not be on the river, but different markets have different demand for these crops at, at different points in time. And so just always hauling to the same location uh, is not the way to maximize kind of your, your marketing opportunities uh, that, that the market gives. So Nathan, the other thing that kind of jumps out at me when I look at both of these charts, it really shows up on the soybean chart and you look at the right-hand side of your chart, especially 2022, it's the overall increase in variability in basis. <laughs> and for those of us that you know teach commodity futures and try to teach people how to forecast basis, and you've done the research on this, I use your research when I teach class, um, well, it's a lot easier to forecast the basis back in 18, 19, and 20 than it has been in 21 and 22. Uh, what's going to happen in 23. So when I made these charts, it really <laughs> concerned me because I don't usually look at it, you know, this way. And so that was the first thing that popped off to me was the increased variability in basis, the, the volatility in basis that we've seen the last couple of years relative to, 
you know, the previous couple of years. And again, you could make a bigger chart and you might see some variability there. But again, looking at this, it, it is kind of interesting because again, you know, when we teach commodity marketing, a lot of times, you know, we suggest strategies like storage hedges where you eliminate futures risk and you speculate on basis because basis is more predictable, right? It's easier to forecast. I mean, these charts would suggest that 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 that, that may not be as true as maybe it once was, right? And I think there's several factors that play into that. I mean, just think about the volatility we've seen in markets in general in the last two to three years, uh, much more volatile in general. Uh, I also think, you know, as you talk about, well, what's gonna happen in 23, you know, I think the fact that both corn and soybeans are in relatively tight carryover situations, that's going to make basis more volatile because when we need crop, we need crop. Basis is the tool that we're going to use to pull it in. And so that means there are a lot of opportunities for that to really spike. And again, not across the board, maybe in individual locations here and there. But again, I, I think that's probably, to me, the biggest factor is the fact that we have relatively tight carryovers. I would expect this level of volatility to, to continue. Uh, you know, I haven't lost all faith in, in you know, basis forecasting, but you, know, you have to be really paying attention to it. And again, our research has, has talked, you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot, you know, forecasting basis between harvest and say, you know, March, I, I would continue to say that that's a, a much easier thing to do. It's much more predictable those times of year, uh, th those times of the year. But the research shows that as you move past the March timeframe into the late spring, early summer months, when we already have a lot of volatility in markets, switching from old crop to new crop, those summer months, have always been very hard to predict, uh, very hard to forecast what basis is gonna do. And so those are the places where I think people really, really need to be careful because we've always cautioned that as a time of year that uh, forecasting basis can be very difficult. So I'm inclined to agree with you. I think, I think the tight carryovers really probably does explain a lot of this. And to some extent, not only the tight carryovers, which we measure at an aggregate national level, but the fact that you've got differential carryovers as you move around the country, I think has contributed to this idea that we've had spot shortages, which give you those spikes. Yeah. And once the spot shortage is alleviated, you see the basis drop back down right, right. Pretty, pretty sharply. So I think we're probably in for some more basis volatility for at least a few more months, um, but it has been markedly different than what we were used to back in 2019, 2020. So again, this chart kind of refers back to the research that you've done and you've updated mm -hmm. with respect to the seasonality of new crop futures prices. And the idea here is to think about strategies now. So the first thing we talked about was the fact, take advantage of basis opportunities, right? If you're, if you're not separating your pricing decisions between futures and, and basis, you're giving up an opportunity to make some money in a tighter margin, margin environment. That's difficult to, to, to walk away from that. Right. And then the second thing is to think about, okay, if you're going to use futures, is there anything we've got that would help you identify appropriate times or better times to, to market, right? Right. So again, this is based on some research that I did with a graduate student several years ago. And the whole idea was, you know, if we're thinking about encouraging producers to do some pre-harvest marketing, like what, what are we basing that on, right? And so this is just a seasonal index of corn and uh, new crop corn and soybean uh, futures prices. And so... The way this works is we're looking at the November and December uh, corn and soybean futures contracts, and we're starting in the January prior to the expiration of those, right? So it would be like looking at January 23 for the December or November 23 corn or soybean futures contract. So this is pre-harvest what those new crop futures contracts are doing. And again, they're indexed to zero for the first week of January. Similar to what you mentioned earlier with your indexes, the same idea. Anytime that that uh, index value is above 100, uh, that would indicate that the price is higher than what it was the first week of January, lower than 100, then that would mean it would be lower than what it was that first week in January. And so again, these patterns here are, uh, I've updated these, but the patterns are very consistent across time. And what we see is that typically uh, the, those future prices uh, increase as we kind of move from January into the, the spring and early summer months, uh, reaching their peaks really in that June, July timeframe. You know, we hear a lot of uh, folks and old timers talk about that Father's Day being, you know, a time of year where we tend to see that happen. And again, this shows up pretty well on this chart. And so the whole idea is, you know, if you're thinking about doing some pre-harvest marketing, uh, you really need to be thinking about that time of year as a time of year when you're looking to make some decisions uh, on making sales. We would typically see, you know, again, as we're shifting from old crop to new crop, 
We've got new crop planting conditions, early season weather conditions, all of those factors uh, result in kind of this potential for futures price rallies, and that's what drives those peaks in the seasonal patterns on those charts. After that, we tend to see, again, this is just average, but we tend to see those prices revert towards kind of harvest lows. And so really, as you're thinking about, you know, 23 or even, you know, future years, this, this chart kind of gives you a, a time frame. It's not, you know, one week. I, you know, I would never say, you know, pick the highest point and you, that's the only time you'd make a sale. But, you know, in that May, June, July time frame, that's the time of year when, when I'm really encouraging people to be at least paying very close attention. Uh, and if you're wanting to do some pre-harvest marketing, uh, that would be a time of year making some sales on average historically makes a lot of sense. And I agree with that. I think the one thing I want to caution our viewers is to think about whether or not 23 might be a repeat of 22. Yeah. And when you think about what happened in 22, those seasonal tendencies that you've identified here were kind of exacerbated yep. by the fact that we were having some difficult weather conditions in South America. No guarantee that that's going to show up again this year. In fact, the early data would suggest they're actually having some reasonably good weather down there. So we might not see the strength in the spring that we saw in 2022. And so don't get fooled thinking about this chart relative to what happened in 22 and think this means we're gonna see a repeat, right? Absolutely, I mean, th that's, that's the danger here is again, this is a useful tool for thinking about historical patterns, but historical patterns are averages over time. I mean, again, we're looking at 32 years of data here. There's a lot of, you know, if you made the same decision over and over every year, this is the sort of kind of premium that you would expect to see. But any individual year, you know, all bets are off. You really have to be paying attention to what's actually going on and what the market is telling us in terms of, you know, uh, what, what supply and demand and what, what markets are telling us. And so uh, this is not like a close your eyes and just do this, you know, sort of strategy. This is just, hey, pay very close attention uh, during this time of year because this tends to be a time of year where we see some opportunities. So you've also taken a look at the price distribution tool that the University of Illinois' Farm Doc team has put together and that we like to use quite often. This one's for corn. I'm going to let you walk your way through that a little bit. Yeah, so I'm going to start off with the, the uh, numbers at the bottom of the chart here as kind of a baseline, right? And so again, if let's think back. Really, the, the goal here is to compare to Michael's break-evens using what the market is currently giving us in terms of a price and, and what the potential kind of range of those prices are. So if you start at the bottom, this morning we had uh, December 23 corn futures around 595. I went into the crop basis tool for central Indiana. I pulled out uh, an expected basis uh, for fall delivery of 25 cents under that futures price. That puts us at a cash price of $5.70. Okay, so based on current futures prices, that's kind of you know, a, a baseline or a really kind of average place to start of where we expect that to be. Uh, when we use the price distribution tool, what this does is it uses current futures price levels and current uh, futures price volatility to create a distribution or you, know, you think about it as a range of potential outcomes for what that December 23 corn futures price could be when we get to expiration uh, next fall, right, next December. And so on the, the right hand side here, we have this table and you can see that again, that, that around $6 futures price is right around the middle of that table, 55% chance. We got about a 50-50 chance that price is gonna be above or below where we currently are. That shouldn't be surprising to anyone. That kind of is a validation of kind of what's going on here. But what's interesting is to then quantify kind of some of the risk associated with both upside and downside risk of, of what those prices could do. So uh, again, you got highlighted here, there's about a 25% chance, a one in four chance that that futures price could go below $5. There's also about a one in four chance or a 25% chance it could be above the 675, right? So we've got a pretty big range there. Uh, and so what I think is interesting is, okay, let's compare where we are currently with Michael's break even. So Michael had average productivity um, break even for corn at 610, right? 610. Currently, if you, you know, sold futures today and then you know, uh, converted that position and sold cash next fall, you'd be at 570 if we got to the basis level that I've assumed here. That's well below, you know, 40 cents below Michael's current break even. So you'd be marketing at a loss. That's not something that I'm you know, real keen on is pre-harvest marketing uh, below break evens. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But then what you're looking at is, okay, well, what are my opportunities here as we move forward? And again, there's downside risk, right? We got 25% chance we go lower than that five. Uh, but again, there's upside potential here uh, in terms of that higher side of the range. So that 675 will be, you know, 75% a 75 cent improvement over 
approximately where we are right now with those futures prices. That would obviously put us above uh, his break even. And again, so what you're really paying attention to here is going back to the seasonal charts that I showed you, right? So as you're thinking about, you know, what sort of marketing you're wanting to do for the 23 crop, at least on the future side, you know, paying attention to those seasonal patterns as we move into the next calendar year, knowing that, you know, historically we see those prices increase, you know, between January and say, you know, May, June, July, that's the upside potential there. So let's take a look at futures prices. This is the DEES 23 CBT uh, corn futures contract going back to uh, really the beginning of January, actually maybe the tail end of December of, of 21. And you know that contract peaked out at about 680. Uh, that was back in the spring. Again, that seasonal peak was going on. And that seasonal peak, interestingly, carried over into the 23 uh, crop futures. Yep. There weren't a lot of people trading it. You can tell that by looking at the, the two lines on the, on the bottom there. There weren't very many people trading at that point, but nevertheless, we did see that peak. Recent prices in that 594, 595, uh, these were, this charge is from this morning. So as you think about it, you know, what would give us some, some reasons to see a rally? And I guess a couple of things come to mind. One would be um, some improvement in the exports, which we have not seen yet, but if that does happen, that would be one positive to take place. Uh, the other one would be obviously what takes place with respect to crop development in South America. And that's going to be a concern, you know, that one really extends farther than it does on the soybean side because of the prevalence of the so-called second crop corn in Brazil. Uh, but the marketplace is going to be watching that pretty carefully. And then the third one is, you know, what happens in, in the Black Sea region with right. respect to Ukraine, the ability to export, truthfully, to some extent, the ability to plant a crop this coming spring, just a lot of wild cards there. Um, but as you point out, there is risk on the downside, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if all those things come together with respect to higher or larger supplies, we could see that downside that you were talking about come into play. Uh, so no guarantee that we're going to see the improvement. Michael, you're usually the, the conservative person on the, uh, on the panel. Uh, what's your perspective relative to the break-evens you were computing? Certainly using certainly using the midpoint like we've been doing here in, in our discussion, I think is very important when you're looking at cash flows. But I encourage I encourage people to really look at that low price, a low price scenario. Run that five dollar corn through your cash flows. Uh, what does that do to your ability to repay principal? Uh, well, what does that do to your ability to 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 be able to take out some money for family living? And so and so I encourage uh, people to do that. Also, uh, what does that do uh, in terms of being aggressive uh, bidding on cash rent and land? And it has implications on cash rent and land values, huge implications on cash rent and land values. But I wouldn't stop there. I know this is getting a little carried away, but I would I would also look at on the higher side. What happens if corn price is six seventy five? Uh, then maybe my my capital expenditure decisions are different. Maybe that's a point where I replace some machinery that I really need to replace. And, uh, and so you, you kind of get the idea there that uh, looking at more than one price. And, and I tell my students, look at three. And I kind of use that I-farm price distribution to do that. I look at that, that 25 percentile price, uh, both on the low end and the high end, and then kind of the most likely price, and, then, and do cash flow projections and budgets according to those prices. So this seems like a good time of year to use a football analogy because yeah. all the, well, almost all the coaches, maybe the new one we hired at Purdue doesn't do this, but everybody else seems to, they've all got the cards that look at, uh, give them, if this happens, I'm going to do this. If yes. this happens, I'm going to do this. And that's really what we're suggesting with the scenario analysis is yeah. to do some of that planning in advance and know what you want to do if prices go down yes. uh, or what would happen if prices go down and what would you do if prices go up, that kind of thing. So think about it from that standpoint. It's, it's really the same thing the football coaches do, looking at those charts that they all have on the sidelines. You've done the same kind of analysis on soybeans, so share that with us. Yeah, so again, starting with the, the numbers there on the bottom of the slide, you, this morning, November 23 soybean futures, $13.80. Uh, according to the crop basis tool, Central Indiana, I've got an expected basis uh, for next fall of 45 cents under that. That puts us at an expected cash price for delivery next fall of 1335. Again, Michael's break even was in the ballpark of 1355. Yeah, 1355. Right? So again, quite a bit below, maybe not quite as, as, as bad as it is for corn, but quite a bit below uh, current break even uh, levels. And so again, we're looking at, all right, let's do some scenario planning. If we're at that average, you know, at where we are currently with prices, we're, we're definitely below that. We've got some downside risk. Again, 
Uh, and this chart, again, looking at that table on the right-hand side, we've got uh, highlighted there. We've got about a 30% chance, a one in three chance of uh, being below 1275. So again, uh, we've got a, you know, a dollar or more decrease uh, in, in those futures prices. But again, uh, we've got some upside potential, right? So again, 30% chance, 33% chance or so, one in three of being above 1475. So again, about a dollar uh, increase in those prices. And so again, same sort of kind of application of that, like Michael mentioned, you're doing some scenario planning, you're, you're evaluating kind of what your financial position, what your cash flow would be in each of those. Uh, and then you're kind of planning you know, what you're gonna do, um, what, what's your strategy if, if any of those kind of reveal itself in terms of how you're gonna manage the farm. So looking at futures, again, look at its uh, November 23 futures. Uh, those futures prices rallied similar to corn uh, last spring, topping out at about 1450. Uh, recent prices in that 1380 to 1385 range, and kind of hovering, bouncing off $14 from time to time. Again, think about what could happen with respect to driving prices higher. Um, I think the number one factor is what happens in South America uh, if we see a, some shortfall develop there. The other factor, Michael, you were talking about earlier is the marketplace is kind of encouraging us to plant soybeans because of the tight carryover. And we really haven't talked about this, but this ongoing growth in soybean oil demand that's taking place because of biofuels is kind of in the background here. Yeah, it's hard to project where that's actually going, but it's certainly very positive uh, long term from a soybean price perspective. And, and I think that's impacting uh, impacting this this uh, uh, corn versus soybean uh, uh, price price relationship right now in, in favor of soybeans. Yeah, and so you could just see some additional strength there as the marketplace attempts to bid acres away from corn and put them into soybeans here as we move forward. All right, so we've, we've really done a couple of things here so far. We talked about um, the fact that we expect farm incomes to tighten up. Margins are gonna tighten up quite a bit in 23. Uh, we talked about the fact that we could see the relatively tight corn and soybean uh, supply demand balance tighten or loosen quite a bit going forward. It's been relatively tight. We could see that start to loosen up. All of that argues for a compression in margins. And so then the question becomes, how do we try and improve our margins? And one thing to think about is from a management standpoint is thinking about uh, marketing a little more aggressively with respect to trying to capitalize on basis moves, uh, separating our, our cash price marketing into basis and futures price. Uh, that can create some profit opportunities and then thinking about uh, maybe taking advantage of some of those seasonal opportunities uh, from a longer term standpoint. So now, Michael, I want to think a little bit about what do we do here in 2022? We're at the tail end of 2022, and I know people are still making some last-minute decisions with respect to the fact that they've got some pretty strong taxable farm income here in 2022. What are some of the strategies to think about? And this is what there's a huge advantage to be, be able to do your taxes on a cash basis. Uh, small businesses and farms included uh, can do that. And so, and so there's a lot of strategies available uh, to farmers. One of those that, that we've talked about a little bit with the marketing strategy is deferring income. Uh, you can divert some of those sales into 23, knowing, you know, thinking that 23 is not going to be as good a year as 22. And so that's that option certainly available. Prepaying expenses, this is something farmers are very familiar with. Uh, trying to buy some of the inputs they're going to use in 23, uh, still in 22. Some of the smaller items, they don't, they don't necessarily amount to quite as much as deferring income and prepaying expenses, but it's something you should be thinking about on a year-to-year -year basis, retirement plan contributions. Maybe this is a good year to put more money into, into a, a retirement plan. There's a lot of good retirement plans available for self-employed uh, individuals. Uh, bunching itemized deductions, uh, you maybe think about doing more uh, charitable contributions in 22 uh, because you know 22 is going to be a good, uh, a good uh, a net income year. And so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about bunching itemized deductions. Uh, hiring children, is, is, that's, a, that's more of a long-term uh, tax advantage uh, uh, associated with that. And then I've, I've saved the, the big one uh, to, to last. And there's a reason why I've done that. Uh, a lot of farmers uh, think about buying machinery and then using accelerated depreciation, either the Section 179 uh, deduction, which is over a million uh, this year, uh, and bonus depreciation, which is at 100% uh, in, in 22 uh, again. Uh, and so a lot of producers think about using those. But I, I want you to be cautious uh, when you use those uh, because these are good strategies for reducing or mitigating taxable income, but these have implications on your working capital. 
bigger implications than deferring income and prepaying expenses. And one of the things you don't want to do, if you're in a fairly tight working capital uh, scenario right now, you certainly don't want to make that uh, even worse. Uh, by, by spending a lot of money on, on down payments for machinery. And so, uh, and so that's my word of caution. Obviously, if you're in a situation where your working capital is really solid, where some farms are in that situation because they're very good 21 and 22, then it's not quite as concerning. Uh, but that's something you have to take a look at. And we'll talk more about how I measure working capital on the next slide. Yeah, so I just uh, thinking about that for just a second, Michael. One of the things you want to think about is an environment where we're heading into much tighter operating margins the next couple of years. That's our projection. You really want to preserve that working capital as a buffer, right? Yes. That's, that's what makes a farm yeah. operation resilient, is to have that cash buffer, that working capital yeah. buffer. And if you erode yeah. that now, you've really made yourself less resilient yeah. going forward here these next couple of years. And the way to think about that is, is think about strong net income uh, and think about two different buckets. Uh, how much do I want to put in, uh, how much do I want to use to buy machinery? So uh, I'm going to put, uh, put my money in that bucket and buy machinery, and uh, that, that erodes the working capital. Or how much do I want to uh, uh, keep uh, in liquidity just in case uh, 23 and 24 do not look very good? And so think about it as two separate buckets. How much money do I want to keep uh, of that strong net, net, ca uh, net cash flow that we've seen the last couple of years in this liquidity bucket uh, just in case uh, things get pretty rough? Uh, in 23 and 24. And it could with $5 corn, they could get mighty rough. And then how much do I want to put in this bucket that I use to, to buy assets? And I think that's a good analogy, a good, good way to think about that. And there's not, it's not an either or. Uh, it, it's looking at the mixture. You know, how much money do I want in each of those buckets? Yeah, good point. All right, let's talk a little bit more about replacement margin and working capital. Make sure everybody's on the same page we are. What we're trying to do with this replacement margin, this is used quite a bit by lenders, but I'm trying to get more farms to, to, to also use this ratio. Uh, we've got some publications on the Center for Commercial Agriculture website that talks about this in more detail, but it's really a, a fairly simple concept. We're saying, is there enough uh, cash flow, net income available to cover owner withdrawals, uh, that, you know, our, our typical owner withdrawal for our operators, principal and term debt, we want to be able to cover those things, obviously. And then also, is there money available uh, for capital replacement? And specifically, when we talk about capital replacement, we're talking about spending the depreciation. Now, a farm that's growing is going to spend more on capital, uh, like land and machinery and grain bins and depreciation. Uh, but over a long period of time, we need to be able to replace the machinery that's depreciating out. That's why it's included in the replacement margin. So that's what we're looking at. Is that positive? Uh, after we've paid all those things, uh, do we still have money left over? The money left over is really what we use to expand our operation. That's why I like this measure so much, is it gives us an idea of how much money we have available uh, to expand, uh, to rent that additional 80 acres, to buy that additional acres, and so on. Uh, let's define working capital here before we get too far. This is typically measured using the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. Uh, the current asset on a grain farm, the big one would be uh, grain and storage, obviously. Uh, current liabilities, that would be your operating loans that, that are going to be due, but also the current portion uh, of term debt uh, that's going to be due in the next year. Uh, and just like other businesses, we're looking at a ratio there of, of at least two to one. If it gets below two to one, then I, I uh, usually that's an indicator that, that, that liquidity is pretty tight and we got to be really cautious on, on, on how we spend our cash, uh, particularly when we're buying, uh, buying, buying assets. Uh, and so when the replacement margin is relatively low, it's more important uh, to preserve working capital. And that's, that's, uh, that's, where we're sit that's where we're sitting right now in 23. This replacement margin is going to be much smaller than what it was in 21 and 22. And so we just have to be more cautious in, in how we're using that working capital because uh, uh, at a minimum, we want to be able to cover these owner withdrawals and principal and term debt. But we'd also be able to like to, ha like to have some money left over that we can use to, to replace machinery that's depreciating out. And long term, we have to. Uh, for a farm to survive, it has to have a positive replacement margin over a long period of time. And I guess one of the things we're trying to stress, Michael, is the fact that even though for many farms the working capital position today is pretty strong, we saw in the last downturn it can erode very, very yes. quickly. And we saw some people get into trouble very quickly 
because they didn't do a good job of preserving working capital we in had, the good years. We had essentially 2014 to 2019 were, were years where net farm income wasn't as good, and we saw so, uh, some very large erosions in, in the current ratio during that time period. And, and, there's, and we don't know exactly where, where we're heading here past 23, but you want to plan for, for, for a scenario where, it is, where the income is lower for two or three years. That's the whole idea of having a cushion there. So you've done a projection based on your cash, for, cash uh, case farm for West Central now, Indiana. Now this is not with five dollar corn or twelve dollar <laughs> soybeans. This is with five seventy corn uh, and 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 uh, uh, thirteen forty soybeans. Very similar to what what Nathan was using. And even with those prices, those the most likely prices, we're looking at a replacement margin uh, that's that's slightly negative. And, and, and what that means, it doesn't mean we're in a crisis situation necessarily there because there is enough money for owner withdrawals and to, uh, to make principal debt payments in this case, but there's not going to be much money, if any, uh, to make capital purchases. That's what that tells us when we have a very low replacement margin. And it is as low as what we saw uh, during some of that period from 2014 to 2019. So let's uh, wrap it up with the discussion about the asset that people are probably really interested in and that's what's going on with farmland values and I think uh, probably all of our viewers are familiar with what's been taking place throughout 2023 it seems like every farmland auction we hear about is either at a new record high or at least uh, very close to a new record high um, and we've got prices based on the Purdue land value survey which was done last summer going back to 2007 on the chart and you know the value for 2022 was $10,914. That was for average land productivity here in West Central Indiana, up from 93.82 in 2021, and up from 81.21 just in 2020. So we've seen some big increases in land values these last couple of years. And I'm going to put our panel on the spot here. Uh, with interest rates going up, I think we all know what the capital asset model would suggest. With this rise in interest rates and tightening of margins, it would suggest that we're going to see something happen with respect to land values. Michael, what do you think is going to happen? At a minimum, the land, I think the land values are going to have to stabilize. I mean, you look at this chart, it's just truly amazing. From 2007 to 2014, we saw a 140% increase in land values. That's much larger than cash rent, by the way. And so we all the there were the low interest rates was a big factor uh, in making land values increase higher than cash rent. Also, also if you look at uh, look at from 14 uh, you know 14 to, to 2022, yes, land values went down, but then they started going up very rapidly again. Again, that was during a low interest rate environment, and so I, I can't overemphasize uh, that, that we're in a different interest rate environment uh, moving into 23. That's certainly going to put uh, you know put a cap, if you will, uh, on, on how much land values can increase going forward. And, and I, think, I think maybe stable, stable, more, more of a stable land value in, in 23, and then 24 is really going to depend on what net farm income does. You know, net farm income tanks, uh, it, it, it worse than we think it's going to be in 23, and it, it stays low in 24, we're seeing some downward pressure on land values. And, and one of the things in 21 and 22, I want to talk a little bit about that. If you look at the factors impacting land values, they were all positive. Strong cash flow, low interest rates, strong demand outside of agriculture, high liquidity, uh, you know, favorable, at least uh, favorable farm, farm policy, at least wasn't unfavorable. Uh, you know, farm policy. And so everything was going in the direction of an increase in land values. That's not the case today. We've got lower margins for 23. We've got much, much higher interest rates. And both of those impact, um, you know, how outside investors look at land. Outside investors look at the fundamentals. The fundamentals are changing. The cash flow and the interest rate relationship is changing even for them. Uh, and so all of these things put together uh, really is an is a entirely different environment uh, than what we've seen in the last few years. So that was the point, Nathan. Do you have a counterpoint? Uh, I agree mostly with what Michael said. Theoretically, like we have to see some stabilization. The, the only kind of counterpoint that I would make is, is kind of anecdotally what I hear is a lot of these purchases are being made with cash. Right. And again, that that doesn't yeah. mean that, uh, you know, we shouldn't see some of the fundamentals come into play. But until people run out of cash and have to start borrowing money to buy all the land that's being purchased, 
you know, maybe we could see this continue, you know, but again, it has to start to, to stabilize or soften compared to what it's been the last several years. But that's the only other factor that I would throw in that I've, I've heard people talking about. Yeah, so I think uh, well, this is, puts us in the uncomfortable situation of all three of us essentially agreeing here. <laughs> well, well, how often does the three economists yeah. actually agree? But um, as you look at it, the real question to be is the time frame. And how far into the future do you have to get before the rapid run-up that we've seen here these last couple of years really comes to an end? And my best guess is uh, probably 2024. And I really kind of agree with what you said, Nathan, with respect to there is a lot of strong cash positions out there. Um, and they've chosen to invest in farmland because other investments haven't looked that attractive. And so, you know, we've been doing some survey work with the Ag Economy Barometer, and people tell us that uh, inflation and interest from non-farm investors is, a, is mm -hmm. a key point. And I would argue that uh, both of those are related to the fact that um, the alternative investments don't look that good, right? Yeah. So, um, so we're probably going to continue to see some news about record high farmland values here the next few months. But as you think about it longer term, especially as you get into 2024, if the interest rate outlook we were talking about uh, materializes, it looks to us like we could see some softness in land values in 2024. There was also kind of a unique event in 21 is it was difficult to find machinery and machinery was expensive. I think that made uh, some of the cash flow gravitate towards land rather than machinery. I think a farmer would have bought more machinery, built more grain bins if, if it wasn't been so difficult to do that. Uh, you had to find the machinery when it, you know it, it find the machinery at a reasonable price and grain bins for a while they were difficult to find somebody even come out and build the grain bin and so uh, and so I think that there's some unique circumstances in 21 uh, 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 to explain the very large increase. That's a good point. So with that, we're going to wrap it up and just remind our viewers that we have the Purdue Top Farmer Conference coming up in January, on January 6th. That's the first Friday in January. Uh, you can attend the conference in person here in West Lafayette or remotely by way of Zoom. Uh, the details about the conference and registration are available at the purdue.edu commercial ag. And I want to highlight that one of the sessions on that uh, panel is going to be, or that uh, conference is going to be focused on farmland values. Uh, with Todd Keithy, our uh, professor of uh, farmland chair here, along with uh, uh, R.D. Schrader from Schrader Auctions and Howard Halderman from Halderman Auctions. So it should be a very, very interesting conference. I hope you'll check that out and, and look at it a little more carefully. And, of course, we encourage you to subscribe to our uh, podcast, Purdue Commercial Agcast, and uh, maybe take a look at the Ag Economy Barometer Reports. That next one comes out, I think, on the 3rd of January. So be looking forward to that one as well. And with that, on behalf of my colleagues in the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I want to wish you a happy holidays and certainly a prosperous uh, new year in uh, 2023. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Mintert.